chapter number 45. I've been speaking to you on the subject of joy for a good many Sunday mornings, and we flipped one uh, Sunday and had a Sunday night and something else on that Sunday morning. And so we're going to do that again this morning. That'll be the last in this series with us leaving town. We'll just be out one Sunday, two Wednesdays, be back on the 5th for that Sunday and be ready for services then. And so, um, again, we appreciate uh, you folks being so kind to us and giving us a chance to unplug and get away. And so, um, just if you do need something while I'm gone, you know how to get a hold of my son. He'll be in charge until we get back. So if you need anything at all, just be sure to touch base with him. He'd be glad to help you. All right, Psalms chapter 45. Stand with me, please, out of respect to God's word. And we'll just read here, beginning in the first verse of chapter 45, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach the terrible, the terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. And then verse 7, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. And look at the result. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. This morning, I want to talk to you on the subject of the oil of gladness. Let's bow together and you can be seated. Father, we thank you so much for the chance that we have to gather. And um, I could never really express with words how grateful we are for these words that you've given to us. Preserved word of God for us perfectly without error in this King James Bible. That's such a blessed, fortunate thing that you, you love us enough to see to it that we have this Bible in our own language. We can trust it. We can love it can read it and memorize it, live by it without any concern that we are not doing what we should. And I just pray that you pour out your spirit in our service this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. This psalm is uh, one that is messianic in nature. It um, is quoted in Hebrews chapter 1. In verse 9, where it says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And by the way, you know, I taught some uh, the other day, uh, I forget when it was, it was Wednesday, I talked about um, the autograph position and the preservation and all that kind of thing. And this is an example, of course, in Hebrews 1 9 where you have a Hebrew verse translated into English in what they refer to as the original. And it is yet the inspired word of God. So don't let anybody ever tell you that you shouldn't call the inspired word or translation properly done the inspired word of God. Now this here is not worded exactly the same as it is in the Old Testament, but it is nonetheless the inspired word of God. Just a side note. I believe, just as another little, uh, just to get this off my chest, in case you're wondering again, I, and you're not after uh, Wednesday, but I just believe what I have in, in front of me this morning is the perfect word of God without error. Amen. I've had a lot of folks come to me and say, well, preacher, what about this? I've got to tell you, none of those things ever hold water. And uh, I think what God inspired, he preserved, and he's given it to us all these years, and this translation is Uh, The English representation of the inspired word of God preserved in English without error is infallible, it is perfect, and I believe that you can obey it and do what it says, and you'll be just 
perfect and fine. And so, uh, back to the subject. A messianic reference here in Hebrews 1.9 and in verse 7 of Psalms 45. And speaking of Christ, I want you to notice the dynamic of verse 7. Talking about Christ, he said, uh, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. And then look, therefore. In other words, uh, the result of uh, loving righteousness and hating wickedness, therefore God, even, excuse me, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, understand something. That when Jesus walked the earth, he was the God-man. So he was fully God and fully human. And sometimes you will see references that address the human side, other times the divine side. And so uh, what Jesus did, he lived his life in many degrees as a spirit-filled man. And to get, give us a good example of that, what we can do and how we can do it, how we can live. And we can never live up to his perfection, of course. He was impeccable. However, we do know this, that he was fully human. He was not almost human or mostly human. He was fully human except in the sense he didn't have a sin-stained a sin, a sin blood like you and I do. And, but he was fully human. And uh, Adam didn't have that either until he messed up. But notice here the dynamic. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, the Father, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of what? Gladness. And above thy fellows. I mean big league happy gladness. The word gladness means cheerfulness. It is a synonym for joy. Now understand something. Righteousness is not a verb here. It is a noun. It is something you have, not something you do. It is something that you can admire, something you can love. It is not something that you act out. Now, uh, it can be that, but in this particular verse, it is a noun. And, and by the way, so is the word wickedness. Both of these are nouns, not verbs. So righteousness and wickedness are things. A noun is a person, place, or thing. Right, children? <laughs> Grammar time. Uh, so then it, that's what it, it, is a, it is a thing. Wickedness is spoken of as a thing. So Christ loves righteousness, and then Christ hates wickedness, or as in Hebrews 1.9, the synonym iniquity is used. Now, understand something. Because these are not verbs, but these are nouns. Now, pay careful attention. This is not talking about our bundle of actions. This is not talking about our list of good things that we do. Or the list of bad things that we might do. The word righteousness here refers to a condition, not an action. In other words, it is something akin to purity, the condition of being pure. It is akin to something, in fact, the word in Webster's 1828, which you should have a copy of, the word righteousness as a noun means purity of heart, rectitude of life, and uh, conformity of heart and life to the divine law. Righteousness is equivalent to holiness. So uh, what, what the Bible says is Jesus loved righteousness. Jesus loved holiness. Jesus loved rightness. But he also hated wickedness. He also hated iniquity. So you're going to have to, and I hope I'm making this clear, draw a thin line between the actions and the attitude here, because it's a noun, not a verb. So draw, a, draw sort of a thin line, line in your heart between what's being spoken of here. For example, let me just give you a short list of what this is about. It is about his desire, his affection, 
for righteousness and his affection against wickedness, against iniquity. So he loved righteousness, he hated wickedness. He loved holiness, he hated iniquity. He loved purity, he hated immorality. He loved sinlessness, and he was, unlike you and I. He hated sinfulness, which he wasn't. He, hated, he loved clean, cleanness or cleanliness. He hated defilement. In other words, he was, uh, he was disgusted by the thought of becoming defiled. He was, uh, he was offended by the idea of becoming soiled. He loved the idea of being clean. He loved the idea of being holy. He loved the idea of being pure. He loved the idea of being moral. He loved the idea of being a man of rectitude and cleanliness and, and goodness. And he hated all the things on the other side of that that would defile him, that might defile him or us. Now, again, he was impeccable. He could not sin. But as a spirit-filled man, he's really teaching us by his good example. And he's saying, look, let me tell you something. I love being righteous. I love being clean. I love being right. I love being pure. I love being moral. I love being without sin. I love being clean. And all the things on the other side of that, I hate. And so the passages are more about his desire and his feelings and his emotion about these things because they're nouns than about a particular list of things that you might do or not do in this particular case. Illustration. It's amazing how much my little farm has gotten into my preaching, and I hope you don't mind that. But there's just so much that comes up that is so relevant to so many things that I need to bring to you. Now, as you know, we have... Uh, I have, what is it, 16, where's my wife? She left. Uh, hope she didn't go far. Uh, we're going to Hawaii tomorrow, uh, sweetheart. <laughs> but um, we have 16 plant beds. And they are about 10 inches deep. They're 12 feet long. They're 4 feet wide. And and I got me some of that good soil, that perfect soil from up the road. As if the soil God made wasn't good enough. Amen? Got me some perfect soil. And you buy the perfect soil, and it's got, it's got no weeds in it, no seeds of weeds. I mean, it's perfect. Hence the name. And I filled them up to the tip top. And man, I was so happy to fill all those beds up last year. And I got me some of that weed cloth and put them on top of there. And last year we had a decent garden, not so much this year. But, and then we took gravel, pea gravel, actually, um, oh, what do you call it, uh, the sandstone, little pebbles of sandstone, and put that all around the beds. And I put more weed matting up under them first and put the rocks on top of that. Found out weeds love those rocks. <laughs> I mean, they love them. You go out there right now and you see, I, Spurge is a little reddish green thing that just spreads on the ground. And, buddy, it is a spreader. And you go out there right now, you, you can just kill them and kill them and kill them and pull them and kill them, and they'll just keep on coming back. They love those brown rocks. Now, they have no root system because they go into the plastic, you know, and they quit growing, so you can pull them up real easy. But you know what? I, I hate those things. I mean, I don't just dislike them. I hate them. Now, I hate them in Jesus' name. I hate them in Christian love, but I hate those things. And so, uh, in, in one, I found out this too about, about weeds. Weeds, will, if you've got a spot that big in one of those beds, they, they love that perfect soil. And a weed seed will fly five miles to find a spot that big it's not covered by that stuff and grow up. I got Johnson grass. I could feed a cow in one of those things. I'm glad my wife isn't in here right now to hear that part. I hate Johnson grass. I hate... Weeds that are out of place. You know, I grow crabgrass for my cows. I got some uh, Red River crabgrass. And it's good stuff, high protein. They love it. They, they won't stay out of it. But somehow I got some in my plant bed. 
And that crabgrass, I hate the stuff. Why? Because it dirties up my beds. And the fescue, which I love. In the beds, I hate it. And the Johnson grass, which is also, I think, very good for cattle. Uh, it gets in there. It's like, it looks like corn coming up in there. Now, look. I like, in fact, I love, and my wife truly loves, clean plant beds. Do you ladies like clean? You like a clean house, right? See, I'm going out of town. I'm going to meddle right now. <laughs> if you get mad this morning, you can take it up with the assistant. He'll be here all the time I'm gone. I like clean plant beds. I hate those weeds, and I, I want them clean. I don't want weedy plant beds. I love to see that clean top on there. But right now, there are a lot of them are struggling a little bit. And um, you ladies clean the kitchen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Suicide bomber. Uh, yeah. You, you won't. He won't be coming back. Uh, I told you you shouldn't die while I'm gone. But, uh, you know, a lady, lady cleans the house. My wife, she'll clean the house. And my wife loves a clean house. She does not just like a clean house. She loves a clean house. With big L-O-V-E. I mean, huge. L -O all caps, double caps, bold print. She loves it. And she works hard at it. But she has two boys that live there, a 63-year-old boy and a 21-year-old boy. And so, you know, we, we, we like a clean house, but we don't necessarily love a clean house. I mean, you know, it's, it just has to be fairly okay. As long as I can get the door open without having to rent a bobcat or something, I'm okay. But, you know, you, it doesn't take much... <laughs> Doesn't take, hey, can we talk a minute? It doesn't take much to make a lady unhappy that's worked all day cleaning her house. If you come in, and all the ladies are going, yeah, get them, preacher. Uh, and you come in with your dirty shoes on. And you walk right in like you own the place. And you walk in and you just, you just tromp through the house as if you're trying to make sure it all comes off on her floor. And by the way, it is her floor. It is her carpet. It is her car. It is her sofa. It is her counter. Not yours, you dirty reprobate. It's hers. She'll say, get your nasty feet off my carpet, off my floor. Come on now, I'm preaching the Bible to you. But it doesn't take but just a few specks to totally defile the entire home of carpet. You, you fellas, we probably ought to get us a pressure washer outside the front door and just shoo, give it a good shot before we come in and then leave the wet shoe outside, of course, because that which is made clean is very easily defiled. And we should be very considerate, fellas. We should always take care of the cleanliness that our wife has prepared for us. <laughs> there it was. Because she loves clean. And she hates dirt. Now, Jesus loved righteousness. He hated wickedness. May I ask you, how do you feel about righteousness? Do you love it? Or do you shy away from it? Do you love it? Does it have your affection? Righteousness, does it have your affection? Are you, are, you, are you in love with the idea of being a clean person spiritually? Or is it just you can take it or leave it? See, when you got saved, something happened to your dirty record. 
you got the righteousness of Christ imputed on top of your sin record. And so when God looks at you, he looks at your record, if you're, if you're a child of God, he doesn't see all the things you've done, so to speak, in the legal sense. You're justified. That means just as if you'd never sinned legally. He sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees the purity of Christ. He sees the holiness of Christ. That is the record. And that's why when the devil says, hey, look at there, what Brian Evans did. God said, I don't see anything. All I see is my son and his record. All right? So, but now if you appreciate that, You'll love that. And if you love that, you don't want to do anything that might soil it. And I don't mean in a legal sense. I understand that's not what can't happen. But I'm say, talking about it in a lifestyle sense. I mean, you know, we're, you know what we're really almost talking about is just abusing and not appreciating and not caring for the holiness that God has given us as believers. And so instead of loving that position that we're in and hating anything that might make us dirty, we sort of dabble. I mean, we're glad we're going to heaven, but we sort of want to dabble a little bit on the other side, on the wicked side and the iniquity side, because we kind of love it more than we should. You know what most of us do? Exactly what we want to. That's what most of us do. We do what we love. We talk about what we love. We go where we love. Justin here, he loves golf. He, he, goes, he loves a golf course, so he goes there. And he takes my son with him and beats the devil out of him out there. <laughs> if, if Zachary ever needs to be humble, he just goes golfing with Justin. And... Uh, Here's what I'm saying. How do you feel about righteousness, the condition? Do you love your righteousness as a Christian? Do you love your standing as a Christian? Do you love being moral? Do you love truth? Do you love soberness? Do you love chastity? Do you love cleanness? Do you love innocence? Do you love uprightness? Do you love wholesomeness? Do you love virtue? Do you love goodness and rectitude and saintliness? I mean, do you have a good affection for piety and honor and honesty and integrity and decency and, and uh, nobility and, and ethical living and blamelessness and guiltlessness and all these things? Do you have a love for that or do you have a love for the other side? Or hopefully you have a love for the righteousness and a hatred for iniquity. This is one of those sermons, and those of you who preach may realize what I'm about to say. I feel it more than I think I'm, I'm able to say it. And I hope that you are feeling it, though I may not be saying it just like I'd like to. And here's where I'm getting a person who loves righteousness and hates iniquity has a real blessing coming. And it's something you can't buy with money. And I want you to look at the last part of the verse here. Where it says, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Look at that next word. What is it? Say it with me. Therefore, God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of what? Say it. Gladness. Gladness. All right? So if I am one who loves righteousness, my affection is in righteousness, and I hate, I, I hate the, the wickedness. I love the clean, and I hate the dirty. All right? Then God says, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to give you some, some gladness. That is a synonym for cheerfulness or joy. I'm going to give you joy because you love righteousness and you hate iniquity. Do you know what we think if we're not careful? We think the sinners have all the fun. 
we think that the, the, the devil's crowd, as we call, like to call them, has all the fun. And that the real good, dedicated Christian life is just not that much, there's just not much, that much to enjoy. And, and I, I'll tell you this, I see a lot of sad Christians. And I, I can't see anybody's heart. I have a hard time seeing my own heart, you know. But I, I think this, I wonder sometimes if, the, if this verse is applied to them in the negative sense in that they, they don't really love righteousness. They're trying to stay right on the fence and say, well, you know, I, I kind of love the wickedness and I kind of like the righteousness. I really love the wrong more than I, like that, than, more than I really love the right. And what God says, look, if you love the right and hate the wrong, I give you something. I give you joy. And the truth is, it's even more so about what you want than what you're doing. Now, don't misunderstand me. We do what we want. We, our desires lead our actions, and they determine to some degree our actions. But see, there's two people. There's one that loves righteousness and hates iniquity, but he, he does wrong. And when he does wrong, he feels terrible, or she does, for several reasons. One, they know they've let God down. And two, they know this is going to rob them of their joy. And the other one who just doesn't care. Look, you know, humanity means we're going to make those errors in judgment. We're going to sin. We're going to do wrong. Uh, so we're not talking about perfection here. We're talking about loving righteousness, having affection for it, saying, I, I want to stay clean, not just I should. I want to do right, not just I should. I want to be pure. I want to be moral. I want to be right. I want to have it. I want to be clean. Not just that I should do it, because I have to do it. No, no, no. Look, the Pharisees had all the right actions in, to a great degree. They, I don't see a happy one in the Bible. So you can do all the right things and not have the oil of gladness, because you're maybe doing it for the wrong. They did it for themselves. They wanted to be lifted up above the crowd and praised by men and say, look at those. Man, what great men those are. Okay, you can have that if that's what you want. But if you love righteousness and you hate iniquity, God will give you something better than notoriety, better than success, better than accomplishment, better than fame and fortune. He'll give you, he'll anoint you, in fact, the Bible says, with the oil of gladness. Um, how long has it been, John, since we bought our Camry? Four, five, six months or something like that. We had a Buick. Bought it in 2012. It was a good car. My wife decided she wanted something else. I said, okay, we'll trade it. We'll swap it off and we'll get you something else. She got a white Camry. You ever had a new car? I mean, a brand new car. Not an almost new, but a brand stinking new car. You smell it when you get in there, you know? And you're like, man, nobody's ever had this before. I bought a lot of used cars and a couple, a few new ones, but this one was white, gray interior. Had those tires all slick. You know, you put that shiny stuff on the tires. You drive off. And you don't want to run through a mud puddle that big, right? Because your car's perfect. And my wife, you know, she would say, and I was all for it. She said, well, let's, we'd go somewhere to eat. We'd look for the parking spot furthest from the door out in the barren wasteland where nobody even knows there's a parking spot there. And so we would park, I mean, we parked way out there. And uh, then we'd walk four miles <laughs> to the front door. Get a workout on the way to the, <laughs> the Chinese place because you don't want anybody door dinging you, right? Because you know, and we all know that everybody is out to door ding us. They don't care about our nice car. They want to slam it four or five times. You see some old somebody that doesn't care. They're just trying to get their door open. Bang, 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 bang. My wife would get out and whoop you good if you did something like that to her. But we don't want to be violent, so we park way off somewhere. You know, you got a brand new car. It's got no door dings, right? It's got no bug juice. That's all I'll say. I'm not going to get graphic. 
had a big old bug fly in our windshield. I thought, man, it took guts to do that. But uh, <laughs> that's a really old one from like the third grade. But um, talk about the feet. You get in there and there's floor mats on the there's floor mats on the carpet to protect the carpet from your dirty feet. But you don't want those dirty either. So you got to sweep and stomp before you get in, right? You don't want dirt inside there. It's a wonder they don't make you take your shoes off to get in the car. That's a bad idea. I shouldn't have said that. Man, I'm so sorry, gentlemen. So you hate door dings. You hate birds stuff. I think birds love brand new cars and key scratches. I don't mean somebody else's, I mean yours. Where well, you're trying to get in in the dark, you can't find the key. Um, nowadays you got that chit chit thing, that's nice. I had a black truck once. You better watch it. I still got the microphone. Uh, I had a black Chevy, brand new, Silverado, 2006. The little, it was nice. Brand new. Took it to Publix. I had it a week. Came out of Publix. Somebody had taken the key and walked down the side of it. I didn't cuss. But if somebody had signed it, I wrote it down, I'd have signed it. I was pretty upset. I hated that scratch. Here's what I'm saying. My wife's brand new car. We were up in Gainesville. She was meeting me in a little place, always going to eat somewhere, you know. And uh, we're going to some little place. I don't know the name of it. It's a little Greek kind of place up there near the, near the, the city hall and everything in the courthouse. Just a little, little bitty place. And uh, her car was perfect. Not a scratch, not a blemish. Nobody had even looked at it yet. Had no, not one eyeball mark on it. But somehow, as she was coming through Gainesville, she got a little close to one of those little stone curb things. And she kind of bumped over it a little bit. Scratched it a little bit. Right off on the bottom, on the rocker panel. You know. It wasn't too bad, but just had a black mark on it now. A couple of scratches. And she got to the restaurant, and she was sorely displeased. I assumed it was something I had done. <laughs> Amen? Because it always is, because I'm always doing something. But it was, you know, as we say, mean old Mr. Gravity or somebody like that. She said, come, come look at this. She was brokenhearted. I was too. Because our perfect little car, our new car, now, the perfection of it, the holiness of it had been destroyed. Now look, what I'm saying is this. If we love a car that much, and we do whatever we can to keep it right, surely we need to keep ourselves right. And I'm thankful that what I've got can't be rubbed away. But I sure all appreciate it. And, and God said, look, if you will love righteousness and hate iniquity, I'm going to give you some joy. And I'll close by saying this. We will never have joy as long as we say, well, I'm going to do this bad thing because I need something to feel good right now. I want to feel good right now. I'm down the dumps. So I'm going to do this one thing right now. It's going to make me feel better right now. And guess what? It will right now, but in about 10 minutes, you won't feel good. Sin always hurts your emotions. It always, you lose the joy. And one of the things that might keep us from sinning is to love our position and our condition of righteousness. And I see so many chasing after things that the world has to offer, 
not loving righteousness as they should, bending the rules, compromising, chasing all this. I mean, I think, well, no wonder that you're, no wonder you struggle so to have joy because you're, you're trying to walk the fence all the time. Make up your mind, I'm going to love righteousness. I'm going to hate, that's a strong word, I'm going to hate wickedness. I'm going to hate iniquity. Don't say, well, just a little bit will help. No, no, no. That You've ruined it now. You've got to, you've got to love righteousness and hate iniquity. And when that becomes real, God will say, okay, I'm going to give you some oil. The oil of joy, the oil of gladness. Maybe this morning you need to decide, with God's help, I'm going to love righteousness. And I'm going to hate wickedness. It was said by some often repeated, if you love flowers, you've got to hate weeds. If you don't hate weeds, you'll never have good flowers. And if you want joy, you've got to hate wickedness. And you've got to love righteousness. Let's stand together. We're just going to play one verse or maybe two of a song. And if you need to just say that, now, Lord, I, I, I need to get back in gear and begin to love righteousness again. Maybe your love has waxed cold. And you're looking over here at wickedness and iniquity. And you're saying, well, I'm just dabbling, just piddling around a little bit. And it's not hurting me too much. I, I need to have some way to, be, in, to enjoy my life. Well, okay, you can enjoy that for a season. But then what you've done is you've disqualified yourself from the all of, all of gladness. Because you, you don't love righteousness enough and hate iniquity enough where God can say, now look, I'm going to give you something. What a great reward, a blessing. What you really thought you were going to get over here, I'm going to give it to you for loving right over here. Some gladness, joy, cheerfulness, happiness we call it. She'll play. If you need to come for any reason, you can come on this verse. Let's uh, bow our heads and close our eyes just a moment. And I just want to ask this, if you can. Say, Pastor, I, I'm not even sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Pray for me. Pastor, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. Would you lift your hand and keep it up until I see it, please? If you say, Pastor, I'm not really sure if I were to die, that I would go to heaven. Pray for me. Anybody in the building this morning that that's you, that describes you? And who would say, Preacher, I'm, I know I'm saved, but I've not yet been baptized since. And I probably ought to take care of that. Anybody would say, Pastor, I'm, I know I'm born again. I could tell you my testimony. And maybe you have, but you've not yet been baptized. Anybody in that position, if you say, Pray for me, Pastor. All right, God bless you, ma'am. I see that. That's something you ought to take care of. We'd counsel you about that if you'd like. And... Uh, all right. So let's look right up here. and We have a... A wonderful couple that wants to join the Oakwood Baptist Church this morning. It's Dr. R.G. and Teresa Smith. Of course, we've known them, goodness, long before we started this church. In fact, the first official act, I guess you've heard me say this. You know it because you received it. But the first official act of the Oakwood Baptist Church was to give a missionary offering to Brother Smith, who is with IBOM, has been for many years. He's 
a landside missionary most of the time, goes across those waters quite often, but um, anyway, he, they'd like to join the Oakwood Baptist Church. And so I recommend them to you. If you like that, say amen. amen. And they're coming from Heritage Baptist in uh, Statham. And so we're very, very thankful for their family. Of course, this is Rebecca's mom and daddy, and Chad's in-laws. He looks very nervous right now. And, uh, <laughs> so let's, <laughs> and you should. Uh, let's, uh, let's take a moment and just welcome them into the church family. And so we'll pray together to dismiss the service and come around and welcome them in, shake their hand, and just uh, we're so glad to have you. We hope God really speaks to your heart and, and uh, ministers to your heart here, okay? All right, so uh, Chris Bedlisi, pray for us.